It's nice to be able to come back and start off the show talking about an officiating controversy. After all of the dilemma, after all of the debacles, after all of the arguments, after everybody being in everybody's throats, I love that sports fans can all have watched the NFL and have finished off Sunday night football and think to themselves, even though you may not love the Cowboys, even though you might hate the Cowboys, Jerry Jones's team got screwed on Sunday night football. You cannot call pass interference in that situation. You 1 billion percent cannot call especially offensive pass interference in that situation. Jalen Ramsey just got paid $71 million plus, and I felt like I was watching an NBA superstar in the paint flop and draw a call. That's what it sounded like to me. Now, I don't know what was going on all game. It's possible that there had been some borderline plays before that, and I believe it was Michael Gallup, right, was the receiver that made what would have been an incredible play to put the Cowboys into a position to take a shot or two potentially at trying to score the winning touchdown there. But instead, the offensive pass interference is called, and as a result, the game officially ends. Now, there are lots of things you can point to if you are the Dallas Cowboys about that performance and say, you know what, we had a lot of opportunities to win that football game. There are a lot of things that you can circle back around on. But to me, what I'm thinking outside of that call, which I think was the wrong call, what I am thinking if I am a Cowboy fan waking up this Monday is, you know what? We looked like the exact same team. All that time that people spent denigrating Jerry, uh, Jason Garrett and saying, oh, all the Cowboys need is a new head coach They went and got Mike McCarthy, and can you honestly say anything other than that looked like the exact same Dallas Cowboy Cowboy team? And what I mean by that is, if the Dallas Cowboys had lost that game, they went 1-6 in in one-possession games last year. And after every one of those close losses, people circled back around and they said, this is Jason Garrett's fault. If we just had a new coach, that's been for like the last seven years, however many years it's been with the Dallas Cowboys. All you Cowboy fans listening to me right now know that reflexively, at the end of that game, you wanted to be like, this was Jason Garrett's fault. What if you just are what you are? And that's, that's a tough thing to like sit around and have to stare in the mirror and think about if you're the Dallas Cowboys. What if it's not about your head coach? What if this is just what the Cowboy organization is? They're good enough most of the time to beat bad teams. But when push comes to shove and they have to find a way to beat good teams, most of the time they come up short. When push comes to shove and they have to find a way to win close games, most of the time they come up short. They are now 1-7 in in their last eight close games. They haven't been able to find a way to get it done. And you can blame Jason Garrett, but Jason Garrett ain't there anymore. And I bet somewhere in his hotel, as he got ready to coach with the Giants, Jason Garrett took a little bit of joy in this outcome. You never want to get fired and have the people that you get fired and replaced by have tremendous early success. You want for those people to struggle. I guarantee you, right now, Monday morning, Jason Garrett woke up with a little bit of a smile on his face. Not because he hates the Cowboys. Not because he's rooting against Dak Prescott. Not because he dislikes Jerry Jones, but just because when you've been the guy who was blamed for everything going wrong, it's nice for somebody else to have something go wrong and you have nothing to do with it. I guarantee you that when you're the president of the United States, when your term is over and you have been getting blamed for everything for four or eight years, you don't want your successor to fail I think most people want their successor to do well, but I bet when that first crisis comes up, 
and the new president starts having to wear it and you don't have to be responsible for it, there's a little bit of an enjoyment factor in just saying, man, it's nice to see somebody else having to wear it. And this morning, Mike McCarthy is having to wear a loss for the Dallas Cowboys, and the truth of the matter is he didn't bring magic stardust with him. The Dallas Cowboy offense didn't look much different than it looked like with Jason Garrett. That was an offense that looked explosive at times, mediocre at times, and you left saying, I don't really know about the choices they made from a play-calling perspective. The exact same criticisms that there would be out there. Dak Prescott threw the ball 39 times, didn't get to 300 yards. Average of 6.8 yards, one touchdown. He got sacked. He got hit way too often. He was just okay. Ezekiel Elliott got the ball more, but he didn't look explosive. He wrote, feed me. He got a ridiculous tattoo. Can you imagine Ezekiel Elliott as a grown-ass man with that tattoo on his belly? Feed me with a spoon? It doesn't look good at 25 It ain't going to look good at 35 or 45 or 55. You don't want to be the dad with the ridiculous tattoo at the pool, especially when you're Ezekiel Elliott and you probably are going to end up fat. Everybody's going to be looking at you at the pool saying, yeah, we know you got fed. You're not getting fed many playoff wins, though. Dallas Cowboy fans thinking that. We ain't gotten fed too many playoff wins over the last 25 years. You fed Ezekiel Elliott and he ran for four yards a carry. He didn't exactly take the game over. 22 carries, 96 yards, all right. Not a real game breaker. I don't know why they didn't throw to him more out of the backfield. He made the one big play in the passing game. Amari Cooper was okay. CeeDee Lamb supposed to be incredible, just okay. Made one play down the field. I just looked at this and said, this didn't feel like a fundamentally different team than what I saw before. You got outgained by the Rams. You had the ball late with an opportunity to win after starting off last year one and six in one possession games. Jerry Jones is sitting there on the sideline pumping his fist. It's go time, and you didn't go anywhere. Now, partly that's because a bad call was made, but if you go look at all all those plays on that final drive, the Dallas Cowboy offensive line got whipped up front time after time after time. Dak wasn't comfortable in the pocket. They knew he had to throw, obviously. He made one play scrambling with the football, but never really put them in a position all night long. You don't ever lose a game because of one play. And the Dallas Cowboys, over the course of that game, lost on the line of scrimmage more than they won. They weren't able to control the game. I thought that the Rams looked like the more physical team, even though the Rams weren't incredible running the football. They were the more physical team. I thought they took the battle to the Cowboys. And by the way, for Cowboy fans out there saying, we didn't get the call, you almost knocked Jared Goff's helmet off and he threw an interception on the play. You went on and scored on that drive and that call wasn't made either. So arguably, that was a big call that went in your favor that you didn't have any business getting. It also rarely comes down to any one call. All right. That's the Dallas Cowboys. Props to the Rams. How amazing did SoFi Stadium look, by the way? I think there should be fans in there. I think there should be fans at every game, but it looked absolutely phenomenal. Other big storylines. We got a lot to unpack. Thank God the NFL is back. How about Cam Newton and the Patriots? You want to talk about a guy who looked different. I just said that I didn't think the Dallas Cowboy offense looked any different at all. How about Cam Newton? How healthy did he look? 15 carries, 75 yards, two rushing touchdowns, 15 and 19 passing. You thought it. I thought it. Everybody out there in America thought it. Bill Belichick got himself a steal, a million dollars for an NFL MVP that suddenly looks like he has a lot to prove. Cam was phenomenal in week one. He looked totally different than he did last year. Maybe that's coaching. Not a lot of difference between Jason Garrett and Mike McCarthy. I think there's probably quite a bit of difference between what Cam had, even though Ron Rivera got a nice win for the Washington Redskins, and what goes on in New England with Bill Belichick. 
They found a way to win, even though I don't think the Patriots are that good this year. Cam is a lot of fun to watch. And how about Brady versus Breeze? Drew Breeze found a way to get the win, and Tom Brady looked pedestrian. I think it's early with the Tampa Bay offense. I love what he's eventually going to be capable of, Brady, with Godwin and Evans, and certainly with O.J. Howard and Cameron Brate and Rob Gronkowski. They're not there yet. Remember this offense just added Leonard Fournette. They're just starting to come together. That New or- The New Orleans team on offense has been working together for a long time. Taysom Hill, Michael Thomas, Alvin Kamara, they're a well-oiled machine. I think me and you and probably others expected a little bit more from Brady and all of his offensive teammates. But remember, they didn't get the opportunity to play any preseason games. They didn't get the opportunity to test out their ability to get going and kind of get their pacing and their timing and their rhythm together. So my expectation would be, while at times you saw flashes of what could be an explosive Tampa Bay Buccaneer offense, we aren't there yet, but I saw some signs that we're going to be there before the season is over. And my goodness, there were a ton of other monster stories that we're going to dive into as well. How about the Ravens? How about Joe Burrow making his debut? You talk about a questionable offensive pass interference call. I thought the A.J. Green call a little bit questionable. Phillip Rivers makes his debut, gets whipped by Gardner Minshew. Nobody saw that coming. A lot of your survivor pools went up in smoke, in fact. Uh, The Cardinals and Kyler Murray, they go on the road against the NFC champ and find a way to win as a seven-point underdog. And then you have teams like the Browns who find a way to stink every year team like the Lions who should be able to win but couldn't do it and how about the unbelievable collapse of the Philadelphia Eagles in their 17 nothing lead that they gave up to the Redskins all of that much to be discussed this is the time we live for NFL and college football I got you some updates coming on the Big Ten the latest there Joel Klatt will join us in hour two this my friends is a loaded program. We have got so many different discussions to get into. As we roll into the break, uh, are tough in general here uh, for the Cowboys as well. I didn't even mention this because I feel like it's kind of piling on. But Leighton Van Der Esch with a broken collarbone as if things did not go poorly enough. I didn't want to really kind of pile on with the injuries, but I probably should mention that as well. He just can't stay healthy. He'll be out for a substantial time. What is it in the collarbones with the Dallas Cowboy players? Obviously, Tony Romo had a lot of issues with his collarbone as well.